So please join me in welcoming Dr. Russell Moore. Well, thank you. It is a great honor to be here. Thank God for first things. And I would say, while I do doubt there's anyone in this room that doesn't subscribe to first things already, I, I hope that you would buy a guest, uh, a, a gift subscription to your member of the clergy, because we're going to need the clear, convictional, rational voice of first things for a generation to come. I'm an heir of Bible Belt America, uh, and also in many ways a survivor of Bible Belt America. I was reared in an ecosystem of evangelical Christianity informed by a, a sizable Catholic segment of my family and a Roman Catholic majority in my community. And I grew up memorizing Bible verses through what were called sword drill competitions, a kind of evangelical spelling bee where children compete to see who can find, say, Habakkuk 3.3, the fastest. And the songs that floated through my mind as I went to sleep at night were hymns and praise choruses and Bible verses set to music. Nonetheless, from the age of 15 through 19, I experienced a deep spiritual crisis, a dark night of the soul that was grounded at least partially in, of all things, politics. The kind of cultural Christianity that I saw around me seemed increasingly artificial to me and cynical and sometimes even violent. I saw some Christians who preached against profanity using jarring racial slurs against minorities. I saw a cultural Christianity that preached hellfire and brimstone about sexual immorality and cultural decadence, and yet, in a church nearby where a major tither was having an affair everyone in the community knew about, there he was singing special music in a church service, singing, if it wasn't for that lighthouse, where would this ship be? I saw a cultural Christianity where preachers would often gain audiences, local in church meetings or globally on television, by saying crazy and buffoonish things simply to stir up the base and to gain attention from the world. Whether that was claiming to know why God sent specific hurricanes or terrorist attacks or claiming that the American founders, some of whom possibly impregnated their own human slaves and some of whom literally cut the New Testament apart, were orthodox, evangelical, born-again Christians who, like us, stood up for traditional family values. I saw a cultural Christianity that was often cut off from the deep theology of the Bible and enamored with books and audio sermon series tying current events to Bible prophecy. Supermarket scanners as the mark of the beast of Revelation 13. Gog and Magog as the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Or later, Saddam Hussein. Or later, Al-Qaeda. Now, perhaps, the Islamic State as direct fulfillments of Bible prophecy. And when these prophecies never came through, these teachers never retreated in shame. They simply waited to claim a new word from God and sold even more products, whether books or emergency preparation kits for the Y2K global shutdown and resulting dark age that the Bible clearly told us would happen. And then there were the voter guides. A religious right activist group from Washington placed guides in our church's vestibule outlining the Christian position on issues. And even as a teenager, I could recognize that the issues chosen just happened to be the same as that year's talking points from the Republican National Committee. Now, on many of these issues, there was a clear Christian position on for instance, the abortion of unborn children and on the need to stabilize families. But why was there a Christian position outlined on congressional term limits and a balanced budget amendment and the line item veto? Why was there no word for people in the historical shadow, in the direct historical shadow of Jim Crow on racial justice and unity? I was left with an increasingly cynical feeling that seemed to be an existential threat to my entire sense of myself in the world 
that Christianity was simply a means to an end, a way to shore up Southern honor culture, to mobilize voters for political allies, and to market products to a, to a gullible audience. I was ready to escape, and I did. But I didn't flee the way that so many have through the back door of the church into secularism. I found a wardrobe in a spare room in England that delivered me from the Bible Belt back to where I started to the Lion of the tribe of Judah. I'd read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and its sequels as a young child, and I found something solid there. As the other Inklings knew, uh, Narnia wasn't great literature. It wasn't a carefully constructed myth as Middle Earth was. But my experience was similar to that of science fiction writer Neil Gaiman, who said this, the weird thing about the Narnia books for me was that mostly they seemed true. They were reports from a real place, end quote. So when in my spiritual crisis, I saw the name C.S. Lewis on the spine of a book called Mere Christianity, I was willing to give him a chance, and he saved my life. Again, Mere Christianity is not City of God or the Summa or the Institutes of the Christian Religion. It didn't need to be for me. All I needed was this drinking, smoking, probably dancing and card playing man <laughs> on another continent to tell me the truth to point, point me to a broad, bustling church that took serious questions seriously and could be traced all the way back to an empty hole in the ground in the Middle East. Now, my spiritual crisis wasn't all that important to the world. Most faiths that persist are tested and questioned and tempted and tried along the way. But for me, the question was whether I was a beloved son or a cosmic orphan. And it seems to me that this little spiritual crisis is similar to a much larger one now, one that threatens to engulf religious conservatism in America. Now, the religious right, whether we trace it back to the school prayer skirmishes of the 1960s or the segregation academy controversies of the 1970s, or to the response to Roe versus Wade and the sexual revolution was always a multifaceted coalition and never just one thing. Jerry Falwell, senior, adopted Paul Weyrich's language of a moral majority, after all, because the movement encompassed far more than just evangelical Protestants, but also large number of traditional Roman Catholics and Latter-day Saints and Orthodox Jews and others. But while the movement was informed by, for instance, John Paul II's Theology of the Body and Richard John Newhouse's The Naked Public Square, the entrepreneurial mobilizing energy was often with evangelical Protestantism. It's perhaps for that reason that American evangelicalism is enmeshed with the religious right psychologically and institutionally and in terms of reputation in ways that the Catholic bishops, the Mormon apostles, or Orthodox rabbis just aren't. Now, the fate of religious conservatism is not just a question of what happens to the country without it. Ross Douthat is quite right that America, left and right, needs a strong religious conservative movement. The religious right, at its best, modeled the kind of civic engagement and civil society that James Madison and Alexander Hamilton wanted for this country. At its best, the religious right reminded all of us that there were more important realities than political or economic success, that we are a nation under God, and thus able to be weighed in the balances and found wanting. At its best, the religious right kept the focus on a vulnerable minority that is perhaps the easiest to become invisible to those with power, unborn children. Douthat is correct that without some form of religious right, the space left behind will be filled by European-style ethno-nationalism, or by Nietzschean social Darwinism. The religious right must in some form be saved, but how and in what form? That question, of course, brings us to the 2016 
election. Surveying the countercultural hippies and anti-war activists streaming into the 1972 Democratic National Convention to nominate George McGovern, not as protesters, but as duly elected delegates, Tip O'Neill was perplexed. O'Neill knew that whatever the talk of the dawning of an age of Aquarius, this was not a winning coalition, and it wouldn't be for a long time, if ever. This old school Irish Catholic party boss and New Deal politician famously said, quote, the Democratic Party has been taken over by the cast of hair. <laughs> we can have some sympathy with Tip O'Neill now that the Republican Party <laughs> has been taken over by the cast of The Apprentice. <laughs> now, parties are resilient. And there are no permanent winners. They're rarely permanent losers. Economic conservatism can survive a protectionist or nativist rise every once in a while because the base value of economic conservatism is prosperity. And people recalibrate to what works. Foreign policy conservatism can for forget about whatever alliances were made with an America first approach to the world just as they survived the Iraq war because foreign policy conservatism is accustomed to dealing, when necessary, with contradictory and sometimes morally dubious allies. For religious conservatism, though, the aftermath of the 2016 election may well be quite different. The reason for the existence of religious conservatism is, after all, about moral formation, about family values. For some, the trauma of 2016 will be healed easily. I understand the sort of evangelical or Roman Catholic who looking at these choices believes that he must make a lesser of two evils approach. Though one bracingly honest about the moral catastrophe involved. I understand that even though I don't, I don't accept the argument. With much of the institutional matrix though of the old guard, religious right, political activist establishment, though, much more than that has happened. The crisis before us now is that of a religious right political establishment that often has waved away some of the most repugnant aspects of immorality, from calls for torture and war crimes to the embrace of an alt-right movement of white identity, ethno-nationalists and anti-Semites, to the kind of sexual degradation of women we could previously avoid by simply not choosing to listen to Howard Stern on the radio or to subscribe to Hustler magazine. Some of these mostly evangelical political leaders have waved away misogyny and sexually predatory language as locker room talk or macho behavior. Some have suggested that their candidate has never claimed to be a choir boy, thereby defining deviancy down in Daniel Patrick Moynihan's language to such a degree that respect for women and respect for the vulnerable and respect for sexual morality seems infantile and unrealistic in their painting of it. One said that his support for the candidate was never about shared values anyway. Others suggested that we need a strong man and implied a strong man unencumbered by too many moral convictions in order to fight the system and save Christians from a hostile culture. Some Christian political activist leaders said that those who could not in good conscience stand with either of the major party candidates this year we're guilty of moral preening and of putting our consciences before the country, sometimes even putting the words conscience and witness in scare quotes worthy of an Obama administration solicitor general. <laughs> it is not as though we were not prepared for the sorts of questions that we have faced this year. Richard John Newhouse warned us about the consequences of a national acceptance of a public loss of character during the scandals of the previous Clinton administration. Newhouse, a priest but no choir boy, 
knew that roguish politicians and leaders will always be with us and had been with us often in the past. The difference is that our intellectual leadership, the media and the then mainline churches, as he put it, quote, did not tell the morally slovenly sector of the electorate that they were right in their indifference to character, end quote. Newhouse knew that what was new was not the presence of sin, but the loss of a sense of shame. As he put it, quote, the most hopeful thought is that enough Americans have learned from this experience, the Clinton scandals, never again to entrust the presidency to a person of such reckless habits and suspect character. But that hope comes with no guarantee, end quote. Father Newhouse was certainly not alone. Jerry Falwell, the elder, called for both President Clinton and New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani to step down from political office since their marital, marital infidelities disqualified them from the office and, as he put it, quote, lowered the moral bar for political office holders in America, end quote. We were told by these leaders that we should not put practical considerations, as important as they may be, above objective, moral, transcendent standards. Don't vote your pocketbook, we were told. Vote your values. The inheritors of many of these very ministries now tell evangelicals, including evangelical women, who have spent their lives teaching evangelical girls and young women to resist the sexualization of their identity and worth in a hookup culture, and evangelical men who learned at Promise Keepers rallies that racial reconciliation is a moral imperative to grow up to stop being, in the words of some, panty waste, or in the words of others, closet liberals. The people who warned us to avoid moral relativism now tell us that we should compare our choices not to an objective moral standard, but simply to the alternative. And the strategy is working. Public polling now shows that white evangelical Christians have shifted their views markedly on whether personal character is relevant for public leadership. In the 1990s, Gloria Steinem said that feminists should put up with a little bit of groping of women for Bill Clinton because he would keep abortion legal. Religious conservatives rightly said that such showed the moral hypocrisy of a feminist movement that cared about sexual harassment and office power dynamics only until such rhetoric impeded their political agenda. Now, a conservative commentator says she doesn't mind if the Republican nominee for president performs abortions in the Oval Office as long as he keeps a hard line against immigrants. To fight the Clintons, some tell us, we must learn to be able to parse what the meaning of the word is, is. To keep the moral fabric of America intact, some have suggested we must learn to manage, like an Arkansas state trooper of old, the consequences of our leaders' appetites, while encouraging everyone to get real and move on. Reinhold Niebuhr, the great proponent of Christian realism, was right when he wrote, quote, it is a terrible heresy to suggest that because the world is sinful, we have a right to construct a Machiavellian politics or a Darwinian sociology as normative for Christians, end quote. Now, the question of moral credibility is a real one, but moral credibility is not the most traumatic wound that we face in 2016. Some evangelical Christian leaders have pronounced a self-described unrepentant man as a, quote, baby Christian. Advertisements in Charisma magazine speak of this candidate as representing, quote, Christian values and family values, end quote. This is not, at this point, a, a quibble between people who are arguing about what is the lesser of two evils or whether we ought to, to gamble with someone we can't quite trust for the sake of the Supreme Court. Again, that's an understandable dispute. This is a question of the very definitions overheard by our mission field 
of the questions of what is the gospel itself and what does it mean to be saved or lost. In the 20th century, a fundamentalist leader once defined a compromising evangelical as, quote, a fundamentalist who says to a liberal, I'll call you a Christian if you'll call me a scholar, end quote. <laughs> it seems now that we have some evangelicals who are willing to say to politicians, I'll call you a Christian if you'll just call me. <laughs> Gary Wills, one of our fiercest critics, said of evangelical engagement with politics that the problem is that it was never evangelical enough. Quote, the problem with evangelical religion is not so much that it encroaches on politics, but it is that it has so carelessly neglected its own sources of wisdom. It cannot contribute what it no longer possesses, end quote. Now, that may or may not have been true when Wills wrote those words, but who can ignore the fact that this is the challenge before us now? 2016 has not created anything new. 2016 has simply exposed some pre-existing points of tension within religious conservatism, especially within the evangelical Protestant wing. Now, if we define the religious right as simply those orthodox religious people who hold to conservative positions on the values questions uh, of the right to life, the definition of marriage, the goodness of tradition, the freedom to believe and practice one's faith, then the religious right is alive and well despite the mythology of an ever-secularizing, omni-progressivizing, Hegelian spirit force at work in the world around us. Evangelical seminaries are thriving, where mainline seminaries are collapsing. Evangelical church planting movements in North America and around the world are flourishing. And these Christians, these younger evangelicals, the next generation of evangelicalism, are not liberalizing. Sociologist Rodney Stark is correct when he, when he demonstrates that the data show that younger evangelicals are, in fact, more concerned about, say, environmental protection than their parents and grandparents were. But they are just as conservative and, in many cases, more so on issues of human sexuality or family definition or the need to protect unborn children and their mothers from violence. If, though... We define the religious right in terms of professional, political, activist, gatekeepers, then yes, there is a problem. The religious right establishment is one big Wittenberg door with an ever-expanding target where a nail should be. The movement's institutional matrix seems increasingly exhausted, resentful, and at war with its own future. The internal family conversations about the brokenness of these movements and, and institutions were kept, kept quiet, waiting for the inevitable generational transfers that could allow new starts. But those internal conversations were like a WikiLeaks email made cringingly public by the 2016 presidential campaign and the role of the institutional religious right in it. For some, the trauma of 2016 is the moral quandary of their feeling no choice but to support, as the lesser of two evils, a man they've heard to employ racial, racial invective and uh, demagoguery and boasting of, of sexual assault and other issues. I understand, again, why some, including some devout religious conservatives, would argue that they recognize the moral and temperamental unfitness of such politicians for office but cast the ballot for them as a protest against, for instance, the very real perils of a Supreme Court increasingly hostile to even the most basic uh, religious freedoms and constitutional restraints. While I disagree with such religious conservatives about whether those consequentialist ethical trade-offs are right or prudent, they are not provoking the crisis that we face today. The election will soon be behind us, thanks be to God, but the divisions revealed therein will remain. 
The differences are largely between the lesser of two evils people and the conscientious objectors over what a vote is and what it means to approve of something objectively evil in a two-party democratic process. That's not the argument. The divisions remain at the part where the old line religious right political establishment normalized this awful development all along. Some outright supporting it, some hedging their bets and whispering advice to this movement behind closed doors. And most of all, since, since religious conservatives were about the only group willing to defend morally, some of this behavior when almost no one else would or could. The candidate did not give us this. This is a pre-existing condition. The religious right turns out to be the people the religious right warned us about. What's at stake here is not just credibility. What's at stake here is also the question of whether religious conservatives even want a future. United States Senator Lindsey Graham, South Carolina, said of the Republican Party, quote, they aren't making enough old angry white people to keep winning this way, end quote. The difference between primary and general electorates is bearing that claim out once again this year. That's even more of an evident reality within the religious right. There are no 22-year-old John Hagees. And this is not because of liberalization. Next generation is packing into orthodox confessional universities and seminaries. They're planting orthodox confessional churches with astounding velocity. The evangelicals who are the center of evangelical vitality are also the least likely to be concerned with politics, not because they're liberal, but because they want to keep a priority on the gospel and the mission that they do not wish to lose. The leaders that they read or listen to are also fairly indifferent to politics, at least publicly. Now, some of this is an overreaction, a theological overreaction. Millennials of whatever sort, secular or religious, tend to have strong conservative moral stands on at least one sexual revolution issue, divorce. They don't buy into the 1970s idea that divorce can be a vehicle of self-actualization and the kids will be all right. They lived through it and they know better. But their avoidance of divorce can show up sometimes in a commitment to mar marital fidelity in their own lives, but sometimes it can show up in a refusal to marry at all. That same temptation is there politically. If one does not see the good of politics subordinate to other concerns, one will seek to avoid becoming just another political hack by disengaging altogether. Those who do care about politics and who lead populist movements tend to be, in evangelical circles, theologically vacuous, tied to God and country appeals that sometimes see, seem simultaneously idolatrous and angry to younger Christians and often form a kind of protection racket seeking to silence Christian voices as liberal who wish to speak out about matters such as racial justice. Can this change? Yes. But such a change means that we must start with the theological identity of religious conservatism. In the broad sense, of course, this is impossible. The coalition is or must be large enough that we will not share a common theology. To try to do so would be counterproductive. The various components and streams, though, of a religious conservative movement must be theologically defined or we will lose the evangelical wing of this coalition, if not others. Now, the Roman Catholics have done this, in my view, very well. Where, in, where for instance, would the pro-life movement be if not for Catholic social thought at a time in the 1970s when evangelicals were largely apathetic to abortion, not able to find explicit biblical proof texts about uh, the issue? Religious conservatism is at its strongest right now in the living room of Princeton professor Robert P. George, 
He cultivates the next generation, builds coalitions across every, across every conceivable division, but at the same time articulates a compelling and intellectually rich vision, not just a political program. And that vision is grounded in the gifts that Catholicism brings to the movement. Rigorous philosophy, a complex defense of human dignity, and a connection to of the natural law, to civil society, and the American experiment. We cannot do without this. The failures of the religious right are tied to my wing, to the evangelical Protestant wing, which has increasingly supplied that entrepreneurial energy, but not the very aspects missing from the movement that are at the very core of evangelical identity. You can see this in the institutional leaders of much of the, the movement. Marked difference from years past. Chuck Colson was a political strategist, to be sure, but he was one transformed by prison ministry and in constant constructive dialogue with such pastor and pastors and theologians as Carl F. H. Henry and J.I. Packer and John Stott. This must be recovered because evangelical Christianity is only of use to the world and only of use to the religious conservative movement if evangelical Christianity is in fact evangelical. And that starts with a commitment to biblical authority and the shaping power of the biblical text. Now, I know the Bible is precisely what makes some religious conservatives nervous about evangelicals. Uh, n not to mention uh, the outside secular world. Our Catholic allies and others are right that a collection of agenda items with attached biblical proof texts is not a persuasive case to the outside world. Uh, Richard John Newhouse rightly denounced the theonomic temptation to seek to impose biblical standards on a society outside of covenant with God. As a Baptist, I heartily agree with him on that. He also warned against the necessity to translate uh, or for the necessity of translating moral norms anchored in revelation into publicly accessible arguments. Again, I agree up to a point. Just a few years ago, sociologist Alan Wolf said that he would take Jonathan Edwards over Joel Osteen any day. But as he put it, quote, one can if one wishes, long for the return of Jonathan Edwards, but he is not coming back anytime soon, end quote. Wolf was wrong. Jonathan Edwards is back, not in his personal genius, but certainly in his theology. The growing sectors of American evangelicalism are theologically rigorous, connected to uh, patristic and Reformation creedalism and to the expository preaching and teaching of the Bible. Now, this comes at a moment when the secularizing of America means that the appeal to traditional family values on its own is not a point of contact with the so-called silent majority of Americans. Our neighbors not only disagree with us on theology, but also on what is to be valued, especially in areas of family and personal autonomy. That even shows up in church life, those seeker, attractional evangelical churches that hide their crosses, minimize their appeals to scripture, and translate their teachings into principles and life tips are still large and influential, but they can only exist within the cocoon of the Bible Belt. People only care what a pastor thinks as a life coach if one thinks that going to a church does one or one's children some good and that a pastor has some sort of clue as to what it means to live life well. That is increasingly not the case. Even if one were to concede that demagogic populism is morally acceptable, and I don't, others can quite simply do demagogic populism more effectively than we can in a post-Christianizing America. What we have to offer to the world is more akin to the abbot in the dystopian novel, A Canticle for Leibowitz, who in seeking to persuade a young woman not to euthanize her child, 
ultimately realizes that the most important thing he could say was, quote, I, a priest of God, adjure thee. When, as he puts it, God's priest was overruled by Caesar's traffic cop, stopping him from this message to the woman, the narrator tells us never to him had Christ's kingship seemed more distant. In an age suspicious of all authority outside of the self, the appeal to a word that carries transcendent authority can be just distinctive enough to be heard even when not immediately embraced. This is the difference that Soren Kierkegaard makes between a genius and an apostle. An apostle is one sent with a word that is not his own. Now, the evangelical commitment to the Bible means the possibility of shaping the consciences of the people, not just by the doctrines and propositions of the scripture, but also by experiencing the world through a sense of place in the biblical story. Jesus recognized the temptations of the devil, not merely by opposing propositions with propositions, but by seeing that he stood where Israel of old had stood before, in the wilderness, before the tribunal of God. The recovery of the kind of catechesis that fits the whole Bible together around the centrality of Christ and him crucified is necessary for Christians to see that they are indeed strangers and aliens, not just in secularizing American culture, but in every culture, that our allegiances transcend the political, the tribal, and the cultural. We need public arguments. We need philosophical persuasion. We need political organizing. But behind that, we must have consciences shaped and formed by a prophetic word of thus saith the Lord. Beyond that, next generation of religious conservatism needs an evangelical wing committed to the gospel, to the reconciliation between God and humanity through personal faith in Christ by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. That commitment shapes our own first sense of identity. And this growing theological confessionalism among young evangelicals is directly related to the fact that a secularizing American culture does not demand that one pretend to have a nominal religious affiliation in order to be a normal American. Those who stand with Christianity must articulate, including to themselves, why and how Christianity matters. And this resurgence of what is often called gospel-centered evangelicalism speaks directly to that. A religious right that is not able to tie public action and cultural concern to a theology of gospel and mission will die and will deserve to die. Now, we already have strong aspects of religious conservatism that already get this and are practicing this. Where, for instance, is the strength of the pro-life movement? But in the armada of pregnancy resource centers in communities and churches around the country, evangelicals in these centers care for the whole life needs of a woman in crisis from emotional support to job training, to child care, to adoption services, as well as with a gospel that can free from guilt and shame. And they are working right alongside their Catholic allies, both in the same centers and in, and in and parallel centers. The pro-life movement emanating from these places is not at war with the culture, but sees the culture as a mission field of the spiritually wounded. One cannot demonize a woman that one seeks to persuade not to harm her child or to persuade that Jesus loves her. This has political implications. These churches involved in such ministry see up close the power and influence of the abortion industry and the harm that this does to women, to children, to communities in a way that translates itself into social persuasion and into political action. That's one reason I think, why the annual March for Life is filled with younger people, Catholic and evangelical and otherwise. The very people 
some told us just a few years ago, would turn away from the pro-life movement due to fetus fatigue. At the local level, pro-life leaders are connecting the mission of the church and the centrality of the gospel to advocacy for unborn children and their mothers. It is of immediate relevance to those for whom the kingdom is first. One of the wrong, I think, assumptions of some in the old religious right establishment is that the church is formed theologically, simply needs to be mobilized politically. That assumption is wrong. We, we see that, for instance, in the evangelical slowness, again, to Roe versus Wade. The problem was not just evangelical reticence post Scopes trial to organize politically. Bill Clinton learned his view that personhood begins with breath, not with conception, used to justify his veto of legislation on partial birth abortion. He learned that not from Planned Parenthood, but from a conservative Southern Baptist pastor's teaching from Genesis. Even now, some abortion providers tell us that the majority of their clients are not pro-choice. They are instead Roman Catholics or evangelical Protestants who believe that they are committing a grave sin, but committed to looking for mercy afterward. That's not just a social problem, that is a theological problem. And the challenges that we will face in the future, whether this has to do with artificial intelligence or ethno-nationalism or the blurring of what it even means to be human, will require a theological set, not just of propositions, but of affections and inclinations. Now, the fundraising structure of political activism, left and right, means that often the most extreme and outlandish characters are put forward. For the religious right, the strangeness to the world is often not where the New Testament places it, in the scandal of the gospel, but in the willingness to say outrageous things on television. Now, some would suggest that even broaching this topic is intellectual snobbery, and yet, Imagine a 1960s civil rights movement led not by Martin Luther King Jr., but by Al Sharpton and Jeremiah Wright. King was able to succeed because he did not simply speak to the passions of his most ardent followers, but to the consciences of his detractors and to the consciences of people on the sidelines overhearing it all. And behind that was a coherent set of ideas grounded in the Bible and in the Declaration of Independence. This coherent theological identity doesn't mean fracturing into sectarian silos. We ought to work with people with whom we have deep theological divides. I don't accept the Christology or the, or the doctrine of salvation of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They don't believe that I am a member of an authentic church, but we can happily co-labor together because there's no confusion about our deepest convictions and where the point of connection is. But when, for instance, prosperity gospel hucksters are received as fellow Christian leaders by evangelical Protestants, we have declared war on the gospel itself. Health and wealth prosperity theology in its hard or soft forms is not just another stream of historic Christianity. It is the old Canaanite fertility religion, except worse because it takes the name of our Lord in vain under the pretense of apostolic Christianity. Now, some would tell us that such concerns are overly scrupulous, since the gospel is powerful and cannot be stopped. And yet the Apostle Paul though reasoning calmly with the philosophers at Athens and with the ruling authorities on trial, spoke in thundering anathemas against false teachers who came to the Galatian church under the cover of an illusion of orthodoxy. He said, we would not yield to them in submission for a minute so that the gospel would be preserved for you. Moreover, some sectors of the old religious right institutional structures are simply too liberal for the next generation of evangelicalism. 
Sounds absurd when one looks at how extreme these, these sectors are. But by liberal, I do not mean politically or culturally. I mean what Presbyterian leader J. Gresham Machen warned of in the 1920s when he said that Christianity and liberalism are two different religions. For Machen, liberalism is when religion is used as a means to some earthly end, whether that end is, defer is defined as conservative or progressive. Christianity, Machen said, will indeed accomplish many useful things in the world. And he gave the example of unifying the nation, another example of fighting communism. Quote, but if it is accepted in order to accomplish those useful things, it is not Christianity. Often, religious right political activism from some sectors uses slogans from the biblical text in reference to the nation that are intended to the covenant people of God coming to God through the mediation of Jesus Christ. And those considerations are seen as beside the point because the texts are useful. The slogans are useful. This is theological liberalism. The pretense of coming before God apart from the mediation of offered blood. When a religion is seen as a political agenda in search of a gospel useful enough to accommodate it, one will end up pleasing those who see the primacy of politics while losing those who believe the gospel. Nostalgia and appeals to the fact that we are losing our country can only work long term if one defines success in terms of the kind of cultural nominal Christianity that can be quite good for restraining some aspects of overt immorality, but is worse than paganism if there is in fact a hell. Likewise, the sort of apocalyptic language that presents every presidential election as an Armageddon from whence one cannot recover is the sort of theological liberalism that makes no sense in a religion in which Augustine wrote the city of God in the context of a collapsing Rome. Even at the level of pragmatic politics, such appeals leave a constituency cynical and burned over. The younger generation of evangelicals, sadly, and to the church's detriment, they hardly ever speak much about biblical prophecy. Why? Because they are exhausted by the hyperventilating of some evangelicals in the last generation over blood moons and red heifers. That is much more the case with endless appeals to act now or lose everything that prove not to be true in a world that is fallen and depraved but also made resilient by the sustaining power of common grace and the grain of theology of, of creation itself. The theological liberalism of some aspects of the old institutional religious right also means that we, we must have more than a moral relativism in the areas of racial reconciliation and justice. When a movement is defined to varying degrees by cultural religion. What comes with that is often the idolatries thereof. That's not just morally wrong, that's self-defeating. Walker Percy warned us a generation ago that to talk about race in the context of Southern religion was to break what he called a gentleman's agreement. Percy said that the religion of the Bible Belt around him was not Christian, but was Stoic, infused with concepts of honor and tradition and virtue and kinship. And he said, quote, and how curiously foreign to the South sound the Decalogue, the Beatitudes, the doctrine of the mystical body, end quote. In fact, Percy warned, the Southern church did not apply its theology and if it did not apply its theology to the original sin of American history, quote, it runs the risk of becoming ever more what it in fact to a degree already is, the pleasant Sunday lodge of conservative businessmen 
which offends no one and which no one takes seriously, end quote. As the world faces still, tides of racism and nativism and anti-Semitism, religious conservatism must lead toward justice and reconciliation, regardless of whether that means a rebuke to those who are our allies on other issues. White Christians, after all, are simply not part of the majority culture and never have been unless they define their primary culture as that of the United States of America. But we're Christians. If my first identity is part of the global body of Christ, then white middle-class Americans are a tiny sliver indeed of that culture. Moreover, the driving forces of Christian orthodoxy and spiritual energy are not white in any sector of Christianity. If left to some Western Europeans and North Americans, the Roman Catholic Church would become the United Church of Christ with better real estate. But there are the Africans and the Asians. The United Methodist Church is pulling erratically, but pulling back toward orthodoxy, largely due to African Methodists who hold closer to the supernatural vision of the Bible than their American and European counterparts. And where is the evangelistic energy within evangelicalism? It's with immigrant churches, whether Dominican or Cambodian or Nigerian or Iranian. A religious conservatism that takes seriously the multi-ethnic nature of the church will be different in many ways from what we've seen before. We will not all agree on the optimal size of government or the economic good of tax cuts or on the death penalty. Black and Hispanic religious conservatives will expect and rightly expect their white allies to address issues uncomfortable for their constituencies such as racial bias in sentencing, even as they are expected to confront their constituencies on issues often thought to be Republican, such as abortion and religious freedom. We might not all have the same solutions to, for instance, poverty, but we must all be engaging and talking about those issues. We might not all agree on how to fix the immigration system, but we cannot disagree on immigrants themselves as those who are created in the image of God and bearing the dignity that comes with that. That's all to the better. And it will strengthen religious conservatism even as it frees us from being just another partisan interest group. A religious conservatism that sees politics as important, but not anywhere close to ultimate, is necessary even for our public policy goals. Take the issue of religious liberty. Some in secular circles assume that an emphasis on religious liberty is merely a defensive move. Many on the religious right think the same. One pastor told me he's all for religious liberty, but wishes that we could do something, quote, more proactive rather than merely defensive, end quote. Religious liberty is not merely a defensive, reactive move. Religious liberty means a positive vision of the limitations of the state and the culture with a freeing of religious communities to carry on their work. To think otherwise reveals a vision of power and influence in which statecraft is more important than the church. Statecraft is important, but on its own, good cultures and good laws merely put more resilient shackles on the garrison demoniac. It's not just our religion that teaches us that the depravity of humanity can be mitigated by law, but only renewed and transformed by something more. Our politics teaches us that too, if in fact we are in mean any meaningful way conservative. We must be reliant on the kind of message that comes to free consciences and cannot be coerced so that religious communities will be free to serve and to persuade. That has cultural and policy recommendations. One of the threats to the religious right right now is the collapse 
of cohesive church communities, especially in what was once the Bible Belt. When a religion is not shaped by community, we end up with what Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs calls, uh, says is the problem of a religion that becomes politicized and a politics that becomes religionized. The collapse of defined, disciplined congregations in the South and the Midwest has been disastrous politically, not merely theologically disastrous. See the contrast, even this year, from the way Latter-day Saints have approached the moral questions raised by this year's election and the response of evangelicals. The difference between the two, I believe, is that there are intentional, cohesive, conscience-shaping communities of identity and social solidarity, not only in Utah, but in Mormon minority communities around the country. Disagree with these these, these, uh, these communities theologically, but they are communicating their own message. A Christianity without a clear gospel is just moralism. But a Christianity also without visible churches is backward looking and seething with rage at what has been lost. We lose character, Marilyn Robinson tells us. Any religion does, quote, when its self-proclaimed supporters outnumber and outshout its actual adherents, end quote. The religious right can be saved, but not just with tinkering around the edges. Religious conservatives will need a robust religion and a sense of what is in fact to be conserved. This will mean abandoning the idea of a moral majority or a silent majority within the nation and building instead collaborative majorities, often issue by issue. It will mean institutions that have the vision and the financial resources to play a long game of cultural renewal and persuasion, not driven merely by the populist passions of the moment. More than that, it will mean a religious conservatism that sees the church as more important than the state, the conscience as more important than the culture, and knows the difference between the temporal and the eternal. We will make mistakes. We will need course corrections. We will have to remind ourselves constantly that we are not inquisitors but missionaries and that we can be Americans best when we are not Americans first. But we must always keep in mind that we are being overheard in our statements and in our silences. Somewhere out there, there's a young Augustine with pear-stained hands, a young John Newton with receipts for what he paid to own human beings, a young C.S. Lewis somewhere in a faculty lounge arguing against the existence of God, a young Chuck Colson with metaphorical tire tracks over his metaphorical grandmother in service to some politician. And there's probably a young 15-year-old evangelical kid whose name we'll never know, wondering if he's lost in the cosmos. The important question is not whether the religious right can be saved, but whether these people can be. The important question is whether the religious right will have for them that word above all earthly powers, which no thanks to them abideth. The important question is whether a people defined by religion have for the world good news. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your, your, your wonderful address. Uh, this is the traditional time when we get to take some questions from our, if you're willing to answer some questions from
from our audience. I will recognize the questioner, and we do have microphones from our wonderful staff here at First Things. So, questions? Yes. You could, Miri, if you could hit the microphone there. Thank you, uh, Dr. Moore. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, being a, a, a solid voice, not just for the SBC, but for all the evangelical community and all that you've been doing recently. I appreciate it. I think uh, anybody else in the community does as well. But my question is, uh, you talked a lot today about what it seems to be there's a vacuum of leadership as far as the religious right goes, how, how you're defining it. And, and in your, your definition of how the leadership has rallied behind a particular candidate who has a certainly a lot of moral issues uh, compared to the other candidate who has an equal amount um, without prioritizing sin. I, I mean, I guess right. we're still equal. But I love the point that there's this leadership vacuum. Um, and the question is, as Leslie Newberger, uh, Newbegin says, that the congregation is the hermeneutic of the gospel going mm -hmm. forward. And we can't look backwards. We have to look forward and allow that gospel to be. And, and, I, and I think that that's kind of what your point is. But my question is, there's still the disconnect. How do we get that leadership? And then how do we get the, the, the correction that needs to take place down to the pastors and the church leaders and the congregations in order to move forward the way you suggest? Well, I think that's going to mean by having the people who lead us in the future be the very people who are reticent to lead us on issues of political activism. Uh, the, the people who have the theological resources to do this are not the people who are enthusiastic to do it. And so the, the sort of energy that is taking place in other areas within religious conservatism needs to be applied uh, to uh, questions of political involvement and engagement. Here's the problem. When one is, for instance, trying to organize pastors and churches in Iowa or South Carolina uh, before the Iowa caucuses or the South Carolina primary, the kind of pastor who is willing to endorse a candidate from the pulpit or to organize his people for, uh, for the, the precincts in that state is not the kind of pastor that typically is going to be found almost at all uh, within the next generation of evangelicalism. That is the, the easiest way, though, that politicians can go to be able to connect uh, with people who are in conservative Christian communities. And so we need alternative institutions that need to be constructed in order to provide that, that bridge between what is happening within congregations and what is happening in the outside world. That's already starting to happen in, in multiple ways, but it needs, it needs to continue. And so part of, part of what I am doing is working within those communities that are resistant to any form of political engagement uh, whatsoever in order to say, I get it, I understand that, here is why. Uh, these aspects of public involvement are actually connected to what you care about in terms of the gospel and the mission. And so I think that's, that's, an, important, uh, that's an important question. So when I'm before senior adult evangelical groups, I'm typically uh, preaching from the gospel of John, emphasizing Jesus before Pontius Pilate, saying, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, my servants would have been fighting. When I'm before crowds of young evangelical church planters, I'm typically preaching the same text, but emphasizing the role of Pontius Pilate and, and, and emphasizing the fact that in a democratic republic, all of us are ultimately uh, the, the governing authorities of Romans 13. And so when you have a kind of church that doesn't speak to political issues at all, that church does not disengage actually from politics. That church becomes hyper-political. 19th century Southern evangelical churches that didn't speak to slavery because those were political issues did in fact speak to slavery by baptizing the status quo. Churches in Alabama and Mississippi that didn't speak to lynching in the 20th century did in fact speak to lynching by saying, while we're calling you to repentance over all of these other things, what you do together 
in groups of people as a state is morally neutral before the judgment seat of Christ. Those, those connections have to be made, and they have to be made at a very young age when people are being formed and shaped for the kind of leadership that they will have in the future. I think that's what's necessary for us. Yes. I think it's often the case that people find it easier to engage politically because they're explicitly invited to, and that everyone in this room is going to get a lot of emails about canvassing donations and phone banking in the next two weeks. I don't think I will, but <laughs> maybe I will. <laughs> what, what are things that everyone in this room can do on that scale of in the next two weeks before a revolution, before in new institutions are founded, to, you know, share God and share love with other people who are differ politically or are more liberal or not Christian, but really in the scale of the next two weeks or even tomorrow? What would be some of the most helpful concrete things yeah. to do? Well, I, I think that... Uh, it's sometimes people say, what can we do immediately right now before the next election? And even when that sort of conversation was being had last year, uh, I don't think this is something you can ramp up and get done in six months, uh, much less two weeks. What I would say is if every conservative Catholic or conservative evangelical or conservative Orthodox Jew read Jonathan Haidt's The Righteous Mind uh, in, in order to understand how people hear moral arguments, it would go a long way in terms of what we're, we're attempting to do. Because the easiest thing for us to do, and this is the case from, from the left to the right, is to simply speak to our constituencies. Uh, this is why we're opposing the people that you oppose and send us more checks. Uh, but at the local level, when people start to understand why people, people believe the things that they believe, why people simply filter out uh, certain aspects of information and, and, and prize other things, that goes a long way, I think, in, in forming the kind, of, uh, the kind of persuasive arguments that we're going to need. Uh, you mentioned before about how you would approach differently, um, maybe in... Um, older generation, younger generation, how, how might churches, especially pastors, uh, approach their congregations differently when it comes to one uh, presidential candidate versus the other uh, in the coming year? Well, that's a good question. I think that the, the primary way is by asking, what is the potential damage that is being done to the consciences of people in my particular congregation? In 2008, I spent most of my time, whenever I was addressing the election, which was a lot, dealing with younger evangelicals who were supporting Barack Obama. I wasn't supporting one candidate or opposing one candidate, but I was, I was concerned by the kind of conscience that could say, ah, abortion, we never get anywhere anyway on that. Uh, with, uh, with uh, Republican presidents. And so let's simply set that aside and concentrate on other issues. Um, I spoke to that directly and repeatedly because I saw something happening in the hearts of some of those people that would be very damaging, not only for, for the, the cause or for the movement, but for them, what is happening to them. Uh, this year, at least in, in my constituency, uh, Hillary Clinton is not is not resonating with them. I, I, I don't, um, I can't think of a single evangelical uh, who is publicly and, and enthusiastically supporting Hillary Clinton, although we had several uh, with Barack Obama. Moreover, Hillary Clinton is not even pretending to speak for uh, my people anyway, within my wing of the church. And so my concern is much more with the sort of people who are willing to, again, baptize um, as either Christian or as on the way to Christian uh, morality in ways that will ultimately be damaging to our, to our witness. And so that, that's going to be completely contextual in terms of what is happening within your particular congregation. Sometimes you have both things happening at once, and, and you have to speak to that directly. But I think it means knowing your people enough to know what, what's happening to them in ways that are, that are going to damage them long term. I mean, when... When I see the public polling data coming out right now, 
that evangelical Protestants of this country have completely pivoted on the question of whether or not personal character matters for public office, regardless of where they, where they land in terms of going in and t making a choice between candidates. That demonstrates a kind of public engagement that is driven by political alliances, not by moral norms. Uh, that's something that concerns me and will continue to concern me long after this particular uh, presidential election is over. Why do you think it was uh, relatively easy, uh, I guess, for churches to be co-opted by the political forces in our country? I think because you had, you had a number of, thing, of things happening. Uh, one of them was you had many churches, at least, that were accustomed to being driven by uh, pragmatic revivalism, at least within evangelicalism, a pragmatic revivalism that, that did not have deep theological roots uh, whatsoever. And were already accustomed to being a part of uh, populist movements in the religious sphere that could easily be translated over into, into the religious sphere. I also think, though, that there's a, there's a bigger problem that is happening within American life that also includes the churches. It's what David Brooks calls the arena culture, in which people find a sense of transcendent identity uh, in either their sports teams or their political uh, parties and movements. So that when my sports team wins, I, of course, I win. I feel as though I win. I'm in an arena full of people who are cheering. And we've translated that uh, into the political arena where my party, my candidates, my ideology is an extension of me in a way that has become almost sacralized uh, in, in American life. And if you do not have communities that are con constantly and self-consciously reminding themselves of who they are in terms of, in terms of transcendent identity, it is very easy to see that as being, as being ultimate. It also is very difficult in the, in the current cultural landscape to be the sort of person who can say, I agree with these people 80% of the time and disagree with them 20% of the time. Again, when, when politics has become religionized, then a disagreement on a political matter becomes heresy. When, when Ronald Reagan says, when I am your 80% ally, that doesn't make me your 20% enemy, it really does in American life right now because of, because of the way that the group cohesion has taken place. I think that's a, that's a significant part of it as well. Please join me in thanking Ronald Reagan. Thank you all so much for coming, and please subscribe to First Things Magazine. Thank you.